Oh, yes. Here we are in uh, the beginning, in part two of our three-part webinar series with the Cannabis Alliance. Um, uh, today, we're talking about the Beginner's Guide to Gender. In part one, which is on the Cannabis Alliance's YouTube already right now, we did the queer history of cannabis legalization. And then um, in about a month on October 15th, we're going to be doing um, part three, which will be on recruiting and retaining diverse talent. So creating a comfortable space for everyone to thrive in the industry. Um, so I do want to mention that, um, I don't, yeah, uh, we do have a couple images that uh, pertain to anatomy that may be graphic for some viewers. I just want to throw that out there and I will warn you ahead of time when it's coming if you did something that, you know, you're not too fond of looking at, but I do feel that it is important for educational purposes. All right. So we're going to cover a lot of different things today because gender is a really complex topic. Um, there are some people who don't like labels, um, but honestly, it's like, yeah, lay, yeah. People, pe some people don't like labels because they feel like it may be too confusing or divisive, and I understand that. But I feel that language is everything, and understanding these labels helps us to understand somebody's identity. And um, and identity is really important to each and every person. Um, so to start, we I always like to start off with what the difference is between sex and gender because. They're oftentimes used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing at all. Uh, sex is uh, in reference to biology, and then gender is socially constructed ideas and expectations based on the anatomical sex. So for example, anatomical sex would include male and female, but gender would be the ideas of what is masculine or feminine. Um, which is different from culture to culture. It's a social idea. Um, anatomical sex is assigned by a doctor at birth. It's usually based on the appearance of external anatomy, and um, then it's written on the birth certificate. Um, the biological characteristics that make up of someone's sex is the chromosomes, hormones, genitalia, and secondary sex characteristics. Um, the sexes are male and female, but there's also intersex. And intersex just means between the sexes. So um, basically anyone who doesn't fit the typical definitions of male and female based on those criteria that we just mentioned, the chromosomes, hormones, genitalia, and secondary sex characteristics. Um, and it's actually pretty common to be born in between the sexes. Um, it's about 1.7% of the, po the um, human population, and, which is about as common as naturally born redheads. So um, it's actually very common that these, these people are born. Um, talking about chromosomes, a lot of people are super familiar with the XX and XY chromosomes for female and male. Um, however, not everybody, it, oh, this is in reference to the 23rd pair of our chromosomes in someone's DNA sequence. Um, but not everyone is born XX or XY either. Sometimes there's a chromosome missing, sometimes there's extra chromosomes, and because these are the sex chromosomes, it's going to affect our bodies in different, way in in different ways in development. Um, so there's some that will give men breasts and less body hair, there's some where they make women infertile and um, and just all sorts of variations. So there's not just two sexes if we're going off of chromosomes. There's actually 11 that have been identified. So um, there, there's just a lot more to it. 
And looking at these statistics, it's pretty interesting to me, like this one in every 600 males and one in every thousand, just because um, I have a super rare neurological condition that's about one in two million. And so looking at like one in 1000 is like way common to me in comparison. Um, moving on to genitalia here's where we're going to get just a teensy bit more graphic not too bad but i'm going to let you know right now that this is where it's going to get just a little bit more um so basically in the in the beginning stages of development everyone's genitals look the same um genitalia development starts being noticed around uh, the seventh week and then but there's a lot of people who are born with ambiguous genitalia somewhere in between the sexes or with both uh, sets of genitalia or just just um, a different combination. And it's a one in every 1600 babies has um, a noticeably different genitalia. Um, there's a ton of anatomical variants as well. So um, just beyond chromosomal, there's just like a lot of different ways that your anatomy can be produced. This is not even like a complete list. This is just partial. Um, but the challenge, yeah, here's Couple more graphic pieces right here, just uh, as uh, some examples of some individuals who were born with different uh, variations. So moving on past those, you know, slightly graphic images, we have um, gender normalizing surgeries, which has been really common um, since about the 50s. Um, it's been routine and it's done on about one in every 2,000 babies that's born still today, right now. So if your genitals, um, they just look too ambiguous, this baby, this infant that was just born has surgery to mutilate and change uh, to assign their gen, or to assign their, their sex. And that's basically based off of this metric right here. It's identified as a boy if it's if the genitalia is over an inch, and it's identified as a girl if it's under three eighths of an inch. Anywhere in between is unacceptable and ha and ha needs immediate surgery, um, allegedly. <laughs> um, and but because it's easier to remove tissue than to build it most of the time these babies become anatomically female here we are so um enters this this kind of surgery it's um it's often irreversible, it's sterilizing, and it's obviously done without the child's consent, sometimes without the child ever knowing, and sometimes without the, pa the parents ever knowing. There have been cases where the parents were never told that their child had, had surgery on their genitalia. Um, Here's a little story about um, this Canadian twin, these Canadian twins that were born, um, and Bruce and Brian. Bruce had a botched circumcision. It went terribly wrong, and their parents decided to give baby Bruce sex reassignment surgery and raise Bruce as Brenda. Um, Brenda hated dresses, loved guns and trucks, and when the twins fought, it was clear that she was the stronger of the two. In early adolescence, she um, refused to receive the estrogen treatments that they were giving her to grow breasts. Um, and at 14, she confronted her father and asked, why, why am I so different? Why do I feel this way? Why do I have to take these hormones? What's wrong with me? And her father broke down and started crying and, and let her know what happened when she was born. Um, and they said that at that 
point, instead of feeling angry, they felt relieved. It, they said, for the first time, everything made sense, and I knew who I was. Um, so after that, Brenda tried to reclaim her identity that she was born with initially and changed her name to David, um, started taking testosterone shots, had a double mastectomy, started doing skin grafts to build a penis, um, and tried to adjust to life as best as he could. He worked, as, worked at a, a slaughterhouse, married a woman, adopted her three kids, but ultimately they just were really, they suffered a lot of depression because of all of the traumatic things that they went through, and he ended up committing suicide um, at 38 years old. So moving on to hormones, uh, hormones are the chemical messengers that tell the body to do different things like produce secondary sex characteristics like uh, sweat, oils, growing breasts, and growing hair. Um, our bodies start to release them during puberty. Um, Testosterone and estrogen are present in both males and females. In general, women produce more estrogen and less testosterone, and men in general produce more testosterone and less estrogen. And as with others, there's a bunch of hormonal variations that people live with. And because hormones don't develop until later in life, uh, a lot of these people don't find out that they're intersex until puberty. Um, this woman right here found out that she was intersex after sending her DNA to 23andMe, and they were like, um, your chromosomes came back XY, but you listed them as XX, and then she learned she had, um, CAIS, which, um, which basically is, means that she was born with XY or the male chromosomes, but she has this disorder which blocks the testosterone from being produced. So um, only estrogen is produced and, and um, female genitalia and all of those things um, were the, ba the basic norm for her. But she too, when she found out felt relieved like she finally got answers to questions that she was looking for for a very long time um then there's this this um rock star olympian uh stella walsh who was murdered and during her autopsy they found out that she was also intersex um, here's some news from this past week, actually. Um, this intersex Olympian was born female, but she has a condition that she has high levels of testosterone in her body. It's just naturally occurring that way. The Olympics are forcing her to take hormones to lower her testosterone levels to be able to compete at the next, at next year's Olympic Games. Um, personally, I feel that this is pretty messed up and that um, you shouldn't be forced to take hormones to change your body to compete in, in, in the Olympics. I think it's bananas. Like, she's not taking testosterone to improve her chances. She's not having gender reassignment surgery. She's not, t you know, it's just something that is in her naturally. So um, moving away from an, uh, anatomical sex, we're getting into gender now. Um, and gender is basically the performance of roles, identities, and ideas of what is masculine, feminine, or neutral. Um, the gender roles are societal norms that decide what behaviors or attributes attributes are deemed acceptable for a person based on their perceived sex. And this also changes from culture to culture. These roles are constructed rather than, and, uh, and, and they're arbitrary, and, um, and they're ingrained into us from a pretty young age and pushed onto us through all our lives. Um, the 
<laughs> so now we're going to talk real quickly about two different concepts before we get a little bit more of, of, about these about gender as a whole but um there's two different ideas really about what gender could be there's the gender binary and the gender spectrum um the gender binary basically is the classification that there's only two distinct opposite forms of masculine and feminine and everyone falls into the, one of these two categories whether it's by social system or cultural belief um, these uh, expectations are very rigid and um, the presence of alternative constructs are usually denigrated ignored and made oblivious uh, and again, personally, we've already talked about how there's way more than two sexes. So, like, there's definitely way more than two genders as well. Like, it's it's just um, binary thinking. It does it leaves no room for these intersex people to exist, and it leaves no room for trans people and other types of people to exist either. But they do exist, and they're totally recognized all around the world and cultures all over the place. Um, so the gender spectrum here is a bit more inclusive to um, what ideas of what gender could be. We have a side where we could be more masculine or more feminine. You could have a combination of the two up top, or you can be kind of without gender, just kind of androgynous, ambiguous down below. It's just kind of a spectrum where nobody's the same, we don't fit into the same box, and it leaves a lot more um, more room for these other types of people to exist. Um, outside of the West, many cult yeah, yeah, many cultures believe that this this happens. Um, so getting into genders around the world, uh, hundreds of societies have had their own long established traditions for third, fourth, fifth, or more genders. Um, in Madagascar, the boys who were considered feminine in appearance were raised as girls and believed to have supernatural protections that prevented them from being harmed. In Italy, they have the feminellos who address as women and assume fem uh, feminine gender roles. In Chile, they ha uh, channel another gender to a accomplish certain tasks and um, the Incas prior to colonization worshiped a dual gendered god. They wore androg androgynous clothing and represented a third gender space. Um, and this goes on from in culture to culture all around the world through all time and eternity, um, you know, basically until colonists decided that it was not a thing so but like in indonesia here they they believe in five genders and um in original judea judaism they recognize six um and indigenous people um they recognize a third gender known as two spirit who assume their own gender roles as well uh this one individual right here ilona verley was a contestant on canada's drag race which just wrapped up a couple weeks ago but they were just a really awesome example of what it means to be two spirit and to bring that into the mainstream culture. They brought their style to the runway and they brought it to the world to be able to see like there's more than one way you can play with gender. It doesn't necessarily have to be all or one thing. You can pick and choose. Um, what you want to represent or include in your expression, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But since we are talking about gender around the world, I do also want to point out that in some cultures it may be taboo and feminine to wear a skirt, but the Scottish wear kilts as a symbol of pride and masculinity. So it's really just 
whatever you want it to be in whatever culture it just is completely different and and nobody really thinks about it the same way uh gender identity is um is their internal feelings about gender how you see yourself which is oftentimes masculine or feminine or a mix or sometimes it's neither but regardless of what it is, no one can tell you what it is other than yourself. It is your identity for you to claim. Um, gender expression is basically how you decide to present yourself. It's your outward appearance of gender identity. It can be your name, pronouns, your appearance, clothes, and hairstyle. Um, being gender fluid, means you don't really have a fixed gender and you kind of go between the two. Um, being non-binary or gender queer means that you don't fit into one of those two categories of male and female. And this, these terms cover a lot of different types of people, a lot of androgynous people, um, but not everybody feels like they are 100% one or the other. Um, here we have a, some androgynous people. And sexual orientation is basically, since we're talking about gender, sexual orientation is basically the attraction of people based on gender, whether it be the same gender, another gender, or multiple genders. Um, being bisexual, uh, like we were talking about before with the binary, bi in Latin means two. So, um, bisexual means you're attracted to two genders, um, which is usually male or female, but not necessarily, um, but pansexual, I do want to touch on as well, just because, um, this has been, been a term that's been being used more and more recently. Pan in Latin means all, every, whole, all-inclusive. So being pansexual means that you are um, attracted to people regardless of their sex or gender identity. You're attracted to all people or you're uh, all types of people. Um, it's not confined to um, somebody's anatomical sex. Um, one of the phrases that pansexual people love to use is hearts, not parts. And that is totally something that I can get behind. Um, being transgender means that um, your gender identity and or expression differs from your assigned sex. And this can mean a ton of different things. Um, you may have heard of the transgender umbrella, which just basically means it's one word that encompasses a lot of different types of people who do not match their assigned sex. Um, so being in transition means that somebody is converting from living as one gender and changing their traits to another gender. Sometimes it's with outward appearance, sometimes it's with surgery, breast augmentations, genitalia, sometimes it's with hormones or hair removal, but it can be done in a bunch of different ways and um, there's no right or wrong way to be trans on your trans journey. Um, I do want to mention there are some people who transition part of the way and they find their spot where they're most comfortable and then they stop. Some people transition a, uh, a little bit and then they turn back the other way. They feel, hey, maybe this wasn't right for me. They, some people stop taking their hormones, um, which can oftentimes happen with having unstable health care. Um, or they won't go through with surgery that they had initially planned. Sometimes it's been known that trans men have gotten pregnant and decided to stop their transition to be able to carry out their pregnancy term. Um, 
being cisgender. So trans means on the other side of or to change. So cis means the same. Cisgender is um, people whose gender identity matches their assigned sex, which is the majority of the population. This is also a newer word that people are using, but not a lot of people really understand it or feel like they might take offense to it or, or whatever or not. But, but in reality, it's just people whose identity matches their assigned sex. Um, doing drag is just the performance of gender roles, usually for entertainment purposes. Um, it comes from Shakespeare and his abbreviation um, of dress resembling a girl. And it was back in the day when only men could be actors. So let's talk a little bit more about this gender spectrum bit. So, but I'll, I'm going to use myself for an example. Gender is looked at on a couple different spectrums, actually. It could be your sex, your gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. It is all encompassed by your gender. I was born a male, and I was raised a male. However, I also loved to dress up in um, in my neighbors' and friends' clothes there, and, you know, all through my childhood secretly because I was raised Mormon and this was not allowed. This I was frowned upon. I got in trouble regularly for playing in my sister's clothes or wearing my mom's makeup. But um, yeah, I internally, I have always felt that I am male and I present as male um, a lot of times. But I also had the once upon a time in a former life, this drag career where I would perform gender for um, for it, for entertainment purposes. I used to um, perform on stage and go to events and teach at a, a youth center and do all of these different things. But when I first started drag, I used to do some of this more uh, feminine stuff where I would look like as, um, I don't really like the word passable because I feel like it's, yeah, it, it, it um, devalues individuals who don't necessarily look like the gender that they were born with, but um, I did dress primarily um, feminine and I did, but after a while, dressing like this, I kind of got bored and I started playing with like bearded lady stuff and playing with gender and bringing in some of the more traditionally masculine traits and doing all sorts of different, um, different unique things for performance value. Um, just because gender is constructed, why not have fun with it? Why not play with it? Why not be silly? I felt like, I was received differently in the public when I started, uh, when I changed into this type of a drag performer. I felt more safe when I was out walking around or take, catching the bus or walking on the streets. Um, because prior, when I was looking more feminine, I would get catcalled and followed and all of these other things um, that were not necessarily the most safe for me. But um, yeah, it was just a different part in my life. Nowadays, I present more masculine pretty regularly. However, um, there are definitely times where I am still at home playing with makeup and dressing up and doing and, you know, feeling my feminine energy. Um, so basically, boop, boop, boop. Um, looking back at these continuums, I was born male. So I would be right over here on the upper left corner. My gender identity, 
I feel somewhere around here. Like I don't feel like the most masculine of people. I'm definitely not the most feminine, but I, I def, I feel somewhere in between and I'm been leaning a little bit more male recently. Uh, or I, the, the way I express myself has been all up and down this, <laughs> like it, it varies from day to day, how I express myself, how I present my gender. So like it's, I, I'm up, it's up and down here. It fluctuates, it changes all the time. And then sexual orientation. Um, I am attracted to men, so I would be over here. So instead of being traditionally straight, which would be on one side or the other, I'm kind of all over the place. Um, and, and that's just the way it is. Like I, my gender is, I identify as being gender fluid. I am somebody who is all over this map. Um, so basically now getting into the history of pinks and blues and where all of this stuff came from. Um, before the 1970s, color had zero association with gender. There's no association with gender. Um, but then in 19, or 1794, this author, this French author right here, uh, wrote, recommended that men choose to paint their rooms pink and white to improve their moods. Um, Almost all children wore dresses because it was easier to change them. It was more practical. Um, and they were mostly white because it was easier to bleach. Um, they they uh, didn't have to get the sizing completely perfectly. And it was pretty common for babies to wear dresses until about six years old. Um, in June of 1918, uh, this lady's home journal said, um, the generally accepted rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls, which is backwards from how we know it today. The reason is that pink is more of a stronger color and it's more suited for a boy, while blue is more delicate and dainty, which is prettier for the girl. Um, even though some outlets were pushing for these gender roles in the 1920s, uh, or these gender colors, the 1920s, it was still pretty mixed in different cities all over the country of what color was represented for what gender. But it just, like, really still wasn't even pushed on people nearly as much as it is today. But then in World War II, um, the Nazis imprisoned the Jews in the concentration camp, but it wasn't just the Jews. Um, uh, prisoner, the gays were also imprisoned um, and with a lot of other people, but uh, listed right here, there's uh, political prisoners and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, traitors and spies. They had a whole color code system for different people for their patches that they wore but pink became the color for the homosexuals um and even after the war had ended and the prisoners were released from the concentration camps the gays were not and they were left behind for experimentation um pink became a um a symbol of shame and it was looked at as an inferior color um, and it started to develop some negative female connotations, some negative connotations about um, what it is uh, uh, about femininity. Um, but then, so then shortly thereafter, um, the manufacturers started switching the colors. They started pushing pink for women and blue for men. Um, but in women's liberation, uh, there was a resurgence of unisex colors, gender neutral colors and trousers started becoming more popular for women. Um, but then eventually it just all exploded and became uh, the mess that it is now today.
Um, in the 1980s, the pink triangle was reclaimed by the queer community during the AIDS crisis, and it started to become a symbol of, uh, of pride. It's been seen in pop culture. It's been seen all over the place. Gender reveal parties have been kind of a hot topic recently. Um, they only started in 2008, so they've only been around for 12 years, which kind of blew my mind. Um, it started with this blogger right here named Jenna. She had a bunch of miscarriages, and um, then... After that, she had a successful pregnancy, which she was really excited to share with the world. So she decided she was going to bake a cake with pink icing on the in the center to reveal the gender of her daughter. Um, and she had no idea what it would become today. This cake has been um, replicated thousands of times over. Of course, it's uh, it was appealing. It was suspenseful. It was delicious. <laughs> um, and then gender reveal, it just became a whole industry. Um, there's a whole section of it on Amazon. There's all of these games that people play. Um, but what began as a lighthearted, intimate gathering with family and close friends has kind of morphed into a spectacle with guns, explosives, and wild animals to maximize shock value with some dangerous consequences. Um, some people have used alligators, there's an, uh, and hippos, there's um, this gelatin in this watermelon to reveal the gender of these, these children. Um, just a couple days ago, <laughs> a couple days ago, this a couple annou uh, announced the sex of their child on the world's tallest tower in Dubai. Um, they were a YouTuber couple, and they spent about $95,000 to do this. But being YouTubers, they've basically made all of their money back already. Um, car burnouts have become pretty popular as well. But unfortunately, a number of cars have caught on fire in doing this. Um, in 2019, just last year, this airplane right here was dumping hundreds of gallons of pink water above a party in Texas. Um, the crop duster stalled and the plane crashed. One person on board sustained injuries. Um, at a party in Iowa, um, a homemade device exploded and debris flew all over the place and a piece struck one of the party guests in the head who died instantly. Um, this is really nothing more than a homemade pipe bomb. And it's unfortunate that this sex announcement had to end a life. Um, in 2017, this U.S. Border Patrol agent decided in Arizona that it would be an awesome idea to make an explosive that he would shoot at to reveal the, uh, the, the gender. When he fired his rifle, it immediately ignited the surrounding dry grass and trees, and then 47,000 acres burned in about two weeks. It took 800 firefighters to put out this fire. Um, the father pled guilty and he was ordered to pay $8 million in fines. And then again, just a couple weeks ago, another gender reveal started this fire in El Dorado, California. And this fire is still burning. It's burned about 18,000 acres so far. So the problem with uh, gender reveal, the other problem with gender reveal parties 
is they're not gender reveal parties, they're sex reveal parties. They're revealing the anatomical sex that they was discovered in a sonogram. And it's pushing the ideals of what this unborn fetus is supposed to look to be like before they're even born. Um, what colors they're supposed to like, even though the colors are completely made up. Um, and having, having these gender reveal parties also leaves no room for intersex people or non-binary people. That one woman who had that very first cake reveal, she, <laughs> um, she, her her child came out as non-binary um she regrets having ever started the gender reveal situation and just wants people to stop um and this isn't the only time there's been other other instances of other children who have come out as non-binary and um so sometimes it's accepted, sometimes it's, um, uh, but, you know, obviously other times it's not so much. I do want to touch briefly on toxic masculinity and what that means to um, adopt certain um, extreme roles that are um, not just problematic, they're, they're, um, yeah, they're, it's 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 just yeah their toxic masculinity is cultural norms that is they're associated with harm to society and the men themselves um things like saying boys will be boys is excusing behavior based on anatomical sex or gender and boys really should be accountable held accountable for their actions just like girls um right and then pronouns as well. I do want to talk about um, pronouns are a way that we talk about people when we refer to someone in third person. Um, when you come across somebody who is gender neutral or in transition, they might uh, choose different pronouns for themselves than um, you might assume that they do. So. Um, so the best thing to do in that in any kind of situation is to ask what somebody's pronouns are that they go by and um if you do mess up to um apologize for messing up and to try to do better in the future um so the common female pronouns that we are we know are she her hers uh, males are he him his we do use they them and their pretty commonly but it's more oftentimes for um for plural instead of just one singular person but you can totally talk about one person saying like hey they went to their car to get their soda or whatever like there's totally possible to use they them pronouns um also uh the i would say it's not as common but uh some people do choose to use these gender neutral pronouns but um z uh zir here and hers and uh, a m and ears which I, I i don't really care for as much but some people do choose to use those for themselves and um we absolutely hold space for them to be able to do so um with with that um with respect so yeah it, it's all about respecting people again because identity is very important to each and every individual person so i think it's a really great idea to start meetings and uh with everybody just introducing themselves with with 
their pronouns with what they go by and just having it be like a normal natural thing that we discuss um right from the get-go i know that some brands in the cannabis industry have made gender um pronoun but or i'm sorry pronoun buttons um so so you can identify somebody based on the button that they're wearing um and yeah, in summation, I just basically want to say that there's a ton and ton of different type of people in this world, and having only one particular way of thinking that people are, it's limiting and it's not accurate. There's a lot of ty different types of people that exist in the world, and um, we should all um, respect and honor they, their existence, their anatomy that they're born with. I, I am, don't believe that we should be mutilating, uh, changing people's genitalia right after they're born without their knowledge ever, without their consent ever. But the reality of the situation is that it's happening very frequently. And it's so that we, it's to try to make people to conform to the gender binary. But there's more than one gender. So it's, it's all silly to me. But yeah, that um, basically wraps up the Beginner's Guide to Gender. Um, I just wanted to scratch the surface of a lot of different topics for you all. Um, and yeah, again, in our next workshop, we are going to be talking about recruiting and retaining diverse talent. And, um, and we did mention in the, the, um, the comments, um, we do have a link for our Facebook uh, for the full spectrum. Some things that we are doing regularly is um, on Wednesdays, we've been doing work sesh Wednesdays, um, which is basically a low key time for us to be able to come together and to develop our organization into a um, fully fledged 501c3 nonprofit organization so we can um, be a global organization and make larger impacts for people all around the world. And um, also we have been doing some virtual smoke sessions um, every other Thursday, which um, includes today. So if anyone is interested in participating in that one, please go to our Facebook and RSVP as going or interested and I'll send you a link to be able to join us. Um, and also follow us full spectrum org on Facebook or on Instagram at the dot full dot spectrum.